hot in here, man. Um, hey, everybody. Hold on, I get my air situation together. Hey. What's up, everybody? Okay, looks like we're making good progress. Hey, Vicky, uh, son of somebody. I saw Lamont Hiller. Good to see you, Aaron Bailey. Hey, XFit. Not, not somebody new life. Danny Mack, Apostle Yolanda. Hey, Ivan Land. Hey, hey, Hutch. I love you. Hey, listen. I think I'm going to do a new um, Periscope series next week. The last one I did was on um, this day we fight. I was doing spiritual warfare every day. But I think I'm going to do one called Church Stuff. Church Stuff. Hello from the plantation. I'm so sorry, Apostle Riley. Please forgive us all. all right, am I freezing? Am I freezing? Let's see. Okay, maybe this should be better. Yeah, I'm thinking about doing one called Church Stuff. I'm thought, Brandon Clack, you preach today. Indeed. Hey, what's going on, Pastor Pat? I love you, man. Hey, I used to have a church in Germany, but yeah, we no longer have that church in Germany. Okay, I'm thinking about doing a new Periscope series next week called Church Stuff, dealing with local church life, um, uh, leadership decisions, leadership selections, uh, just church stuff. Um, conflict, teams, growth, vision, prayer, worship, uh, ministry, church mothers. No, I won't uh, be doing that. But I'm thinking about having that be at. All right, I got a little bit, and I want to give you some insight on some stuff I'm thinking about about church stuff. So let's go. Let's go ahead and uh, share this for those of you that have not already done it. Y'all know uh, my periscopes have a tendency for, for whatever reason where I'm at to go in and out and then freeze a little bit. So let's try to make this work while we can. Um, thank you for all of you that are sharing and that have had shared already. Trier forever. Uh, my last scope on snakes is on time. Amen. Hey, Diva to Infinity, thank you so very much for being a part of here. Let me know. I heard about your mom, and I don't know where you are with that, but let me know if there's anything I can do. I want to be as supportive if, as possible. All right. Um, all right. Uh, church stuff. Today I'm going to talk about um, what you don't want your leader to do. You don't ever want your leader to do this to you. Okay. Hey, Marcus Mackey, church stuff. Yeah. I'm thinking we're going to do church stuff next week, like a Periscope class for people who serve in church. Um, which is a whole different issue and whole different thing. Cause I'm realizing we don't have a lot of emphasis on, um, uh, becoming a servant. Uh, so th that would probably start with controversy. Nonetheless, um, let's do this. Good at, Hello for everybody just got in. Hello, hello, hello. All right. I'm going to talk about this. Um, I have been pastoring. It's been a decade and two years this year. And um, I, I, and, and, and I, I, I still feel like I've got so much to learn, uh, particularly because... Um, a lot of the wisdom that's available is not applicable to the context of ministry that I have, uh, particularly um, uh, being in the inner city, being called to the inner city, um, um, having a consistent growth rate. Unfortunately, in my tradition, that was not the case. It was very unlikely and it was very un, um, common for churches to grow regularly where I come from. And so there's a lot of different variables that go with this. And I, I, I equate it, like many of you, um, pastoring to preaching. And so when I realized that uh, probably 90% of pastoring was actually leadership and 10% was preaching, then I realized that a lot of our sources that we rely on to train us to handle uh, the life of a local church is actually unreliable uh, because it, there are some people who are great preachers and they're not really suited for leadership and they don't really have strong leadership ability. So people often 
um, predicate their ability to pastor effectively on their ability to preach and it's not the truth um, and so um, I want to give you something today that's going to be really interesting wisdom for you to consider don't respond hostily or vile uh, I just want you to think about this and it's going to be interesting yes Adrian Davis that book is going to be phenomenal here is my issue or here is the thing I want you to do um, this what I'm going to talk about right now is going to be provided that you are in the right church under the right leader um, and what I mean right is I mean God assigned God ordained um, I think people can be great leaders and not necessarily be suited for you or what God is doing with you um, there are a few of us pastors out here who believe that we don't own God's people okay uh, that it is not our job to be the Lord over people's lives and destinies. And so there's a couple of us in the world who don't get mad that people decide to do things with their lives or go places. We, we have no interest in controlling you because our job is to lead you. And leading people is not controlling them. And so that's very important. Melvin Cross, nobody's freezing bad but you. It's probably your Android phone. So, yeah, um, <laughs> that is an uncommon breed of us. Um, so what I'm about to advise you in <laughs> is in this context. I am assuming that you are in a healthy house, that you are growing. I am assuming that you have a great leader who is holy, righteous, not living double lives, all of that good stuff, and that there is reciprocation, you serve, you grow. Um, I'm assuming that. That's the, what makes this um, discussion applicable to you. Any other scenario, this may not be applicable to you, okay? So this, this is what we're dealing with. Um, there's a lot of things that your pastor, when it's God's leader for your life, is stocked with to be able to be and do for you. A lot of it is spiritual, uh, a lot of it is supernatural, um, but there's a lot of things uh, and a lot of abilities that God stocks the leader he assigns to your life to be able to do for you and to be able to partner with God for what he's doing in you. Um, uh, how God is bringing you into your potential, how God is moving you into your purpose, how God is uh, uh, helping you in your progress, your process, deliverance, all of that stuff. Um, and so God stocks the life, the soul, the, the intelligence um, of leaders to be able to handle the people that God assigns to them. I mean, it's called capacity, right? So... But one of the things that God has given, let's do some work, your leader, that you want your leader to give you, okay, you ready? Pay attention, is expectation. I believe a part of what God puts in a leader that is assigned to your life is the ability to expect things of you. I expect you to grow. I expect, now we're not talking about I expect you to wash my car, I expect you to buff my shoes. We're talking about expectations based upon your highest self. And what I'm learning is that there are people who will become a part of churches and they'll be there. Some will even be faithful, some will be consistent. Um, and they'll be with their leaders or serving in their houses, on teams or with people, blah, 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 blah. And because of that progress and because of that presentation, a leader will develop uh, a certain expectation for what it's likely you will do. And I'm not saying it's unfair. I'm not saying it's unrealistic. But basically, in the heart of that leader, it's like, I know what is likely that you will do and not do. And I also know what you have the potential to live up to growing into and to live up to becoming. That's important for your leader to have. I'm going to tell you what's dangerous. What is dangerous for you, provided that you are in a healthy house, under a healthy leader, and that's where God wants you. One of the most dangerous things your leader could do to you is to withdraw his or her expectations of you. So if you are in a house and you are under a leader, 
where in the leader's heart and mind, he has basically made a decision because of your behavior or your inconsistency or your spiritual health or whatever the variables are around it. And they've decided to no longer expect for you to be better than what you are. You are in a very bad place. Because your leaders, if they're God's leader, your leader's expectation of you becomes leverage for wisdom and leverage for counsel. When a leader has expectation of you, it means that when you make a mistake, it means that when you've not performed to your best ability, it means that when you've been inconsistent, you've not met a margin, you've not met a standard, or you've just done something or felt a way or had a perspective that was not suitable um, for who you who you have the potential to be or how you have the potential to handle conflict or life or whatever the issue is. When a leader in, in their heart, if they're leading you on a team or they're leading you in the church, basically has this idea, this is how that person is and I would be okay if they changed or okay if they didn't. You have lost a powerful resource and the resource you have lost is that a wise leader, a smart leader, they're going to preserve their energy and they're not going to push you beyond what you have proven you have the ability to receive, to be, or to be made into. So this does not mean that you have to be perfect. This does not mean that you can't make mistakes. This does make mistakes, forgive me. And this does not mean that you have to do things right. This don't this doesn't even mean that you can't have things about you, potentials that you aren't aware of. That's why the leader is there to help you interpret and decode your potentials and the possibilities of who you are. But after a, a, a period of time when you're working with and serving a leader, and that leader, and, and many times what I know is, sometimes they won't even know it. I talk to pastors because I pastor them, and I'll hear their uh, challenges with their people or try to counsel um, them about what's going on with their teams and who's walking with you and all of that stuff. And I'll hear the absence of expectation in a leader to a people that they've been assigned to. And I always capitalize on that, that disparity and start to talk. Somebody says, what do you do when your leader becomes envious of your growth? Well, when a leader becomes envious of your growth, that person has stopped being your leader and they have started being your competition. And it is at the juncture where a leader is intimidated by your personal growth that they have actually sabotaged their ability to effectively lead you. So we stay in situations like that uh, in faithfulness to God, quote unquote, but God would never give you a leader that had it within him or her to be intimidated by what he was making you. They're, they're not a leader. They're just a big sheep at that particular point. So um, I can hear that when I'm talking to leaders, that absence of, of expectation, okay? And whenever a leader does not expect you to be great and does not expect you to be consistent and does not expect you uh, to grow and does not expect you to rebound, what is missing is now that leader's energy level towards you is going to change, that leader's empathy towards you is going to change, altruism is going to change, access is going to change. If a leader changes his or her expectations of you, they're not going to necessarily be consistent with the level of access they're going to give you. A sign that a leader has lost expectation of you, please hear this, is they no longer consider you worth, now this is hard talk, I'm talking for them, they won't tell you this, so I, I may lose my national preacher card, but I, you know, I, I haven't paid my membership fees this year anyway, so I can tell the secrets. But they don't think you're worth rebuking. Now, no matter what they say, no matter what their pat, listen, I lead pastors, so I know how they feel. I am one. There are leaders who will walk with you, invest with you, counsel you, blah, 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 blah. And after a while, their heart will go into a place where they really believe this person, this young lady, this young man is going to do what they want to do. They're going to grow, 
how they want to grow. They really want to lead themselves and use my face as the resume builder, as the stamp and as the seal and as the decoy for the real truth, which is that you're leading yourself and you're using my name to do it or my face to do it or my church or my brand or whatever. And so they won't give the energy and the Bible, if you study the book of, of Proverbs, the Bible warns and cautions about rebuking fools versus rebuking wise men. It actually says, if you rebuke a fool, they'll become enraged. But it says, if you rebuke a wise man, he will become wiser. That rebuke should actually release harvest. So if a leader corrects you about the type of um, leader you are, or the type of servant you are, or the type of singer you are, or the type of manager, I mean, whatever, a sign that they have stopped expecting things out of you is that they allow you to continue in error. And my heart would break if I learned that my pastor thought I was prone to error, but did not invest the time, the energy, the effort, or the whatever to irrespective of how I felt about it, deal with me about my direction. And if it's not a directional issue, to confront me when I'm living beneath my potential. Many of you may be living beneath your potential and may be walking blindly into purpose and into pursuit and all of that, but because of how you postured yourself, because of how you carried yourself, because of your attitude or your character, your leader is probably resolved, I am going to hug you, kiss you, see you in the in the in the pulpit and preach to you but i won't exert the energy necessary to correct you and i won't exert the energy necessary to invest in you because i don't expect it in my own heart every season a part of what i do for myself is i evaluate where my energy is going and if i still have expectations so I think about people that I work with or leaders in my church and I say, hmm, if this person were to um, fail in this way or not live up to their promise or not live up to their word, how would I feel? And if I could foresee them or project them being subpar or being substandard or being mediocre and I'm resolved with it, then there is a problem. It means that something has happened where I no longer expect them to be anything other than what they already are. That is a dangerous, 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 dangerous thing. Now, somebody's saying that's not a spiritual father. That's Eli. No, it's just a case of killer sheep. See, the thing is, is when you're considering church stuff, I love that point. We, we have a tendency to interact as if whoever files the complaint first has the majority of the weight. Like, for example, everybody talks about church hurt except for in the context of the pastor. So when you've been hurt by something a pastor has done or a pastor has said or a pastor has not done or a pastor has said, nobody ever thinks to go and interview that leader about why he did it, if he did it, or if your projections or accusations held true. You see, as pastors, there is no human resources department. It basically acts like if you tithe and you sit in the pulpit, then you have the right to complain and be validated with your perspective. So that's why when people come to my church and they're like, I've been through church hurt, I've been through church hurt. Mm. I stopped believing in church hurt a long time ago. What I believe is that people hurt people and the way we build democratically. Uh, uh, in the church is that whoever files the complaint first probably has the right of thing. But you've got to know that it takes wisdom and it takes a level of maturity and it actually takes leadership. Now, I can say this as an overseer. I have a lot of pastors that I oversee. And one of the things that I know is there are times when leaders are dead wrong, dead wrong, and that they don't have courage and they don't have counsel or they don't have the resources to handle themselves during um, um, hurtful experiences or through disappointing times. Um, as a leader, 
some may disagree with this, I don't think there's a more self-sacrificing job in the world than being called to pastor people. I don't think there's a more self-sacrificing job in the world. We are just as much, in my opinion, if you're doing it right in the line of duty as your cops, your firefighters, your surgeons, and your armed forces. And the reason I say that, and some people may get mad at that, the reason I say that is because no, we may or may not be, you know, D dutching and dodging bullets in the streets and pulling people out of literal fires, but our punishment is much worse than any of them. A cop may take a bullet for you and a firefighter may pull you out of a, a building, but when he gets to heaven, God will ask him nothing about what he did with your soul. And the currency of the spirit world is not heroic deeds, it's souls. That's what this whole competition is about. That's what this whole war is about. Heaven and hell want the same thing and that is the accrual and the retrieval of souls. So because that's our thing and that's what we steward and that's what we manage, the Bible says the Holy Ghost has made us overseers over them. We have to not only give presentation to God about what we've done with ours, but we'd all, we've also got to give presentation to God about what we've done with yours. So I, you know, I think that the fear of the Lord has to be taken and, and to be very honest with you, I try to convince as many people as possible out of this line of work. If I can, if I meet a preacher who, who really is set on it, I, I don't confirm it or deny it until I absolutely know because I know it's not for the faint at heart. And uh, I know that it, it is something that is the most self sac You have to li literally be built to handle it. It's, it's just, it's a lot of stuff. So if you are serving in a house, on a team, on a vision, your heart is there. You're supposed to be there. This is God's leader for your life. You never want that leader to withdraw his or her expectations of you. Now, provided that you are in the leader or under the leader you're supposed to be with, you really do want them to have high expectations. But there's something you can do about helping your leader to believe that you have more in you than what you're manifesting. You can um, um, do your best. For example, with me, I never really, um, I'm gonna tell you what's important to me. Now, all nations, if you're watching this, cover your ears. I love stellar servants, I really do. And, and I love the underdog. I love, you know, people who work hard. And I had, listen to me, I've got a couple of problem people, but to be very honest, for the most part, I have some real hard workers at All Nations people that serve, people that work, people that love my people, people that treat my people the way that I would treat them. I mean, I have some really good hard workers, so let me say that. But I'm gonna tell you the people that stand out to me most. I love the leaders, the servants in my house that can serve anonymously without the desire for my me to be aware that they are serving. I love when people serve without having to be seen. Like to me, when I'm considering faithfulness, I don't just look at the people who are always there when I'm there. I look at the people who are routinely out when I'm out. I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't look at the people who 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 praise me and adore me and and treat my team as if they are incompetent and say things like I love you but this is the church mm -mm. because to me there's no way to love me and trust me and follow me as a leader and disrespect and dishonor those that I've delegated authority to because that is a reflection of my leadership skill and decision making so, you know, this is church stuff. These are things that you've got to look. But to me, it's always been impressive. Like for me, my wife would work for, with people for years that I didn't know. I had to ask my wife a couple of weeks ago, how does your operations want? Right. So for me at our church, my wife is the leader of our entire educational structure. And if you've not been to All Nations, it's a real engine, man. It's a fully running engine. I mean, you got finals, you get grades. You, I mean, it's a real engine, which is why most people just come and become visitors for years without joining because they don't want to go through half them classes. But, but uh, I had to ask my wife, 
babe, who's your team? Can you introduce me to your team? Like who works with you? And so she started introducing me to people that I didn't even know. I mean, our church is sizable. So people that I had never met before, people that I had never engaged before, and it blessed me that they were working in an area of ministry that didn't get them automatic stage and automatic scenery with me. It really, really, really blessed me. Um, those are the type of people that it's healthy to have high expectation of because if you're getting stars and you're being consistent and you're being loyal and you're being faithful when the lights are off, then certainly when the lights are on, you should be the truest you and the most uh, uh, consistent you and the most competent you that you are. That's really very important. So stuff like that really means a lot to me. You know, when you um, have a lot of traffic in a house, you get people for a lot of different reasons and uh, sometimes it takes you a little while to vet them but as a leader and as a leader of leaders one of the things that I'm cautious about is where I put my expectation there are a lot of pastors and many of you may be watching me right now who are carrying depression because of your 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 uh, your lack of ability to place expectation in the right areas maybe you are a leader and you've served and you've labored with people, you've given people opportunity, you have been consistent, you have availed yourself, you have given an audience to people, all of that stuff, and you struggled to pull somebody to a certain level of, of proficiency or a certain level of efficiency or a certain level of productivity, and when you pull them, they start fighting you, and now you're depressed, and now you are bitter. Listen to me. Do not allow yourself to internalize those experiences with those candidates to make you less effective for the other people that need you. That's so very important. Now, here is the trick. This is sure stuff. You may not even notice. See, you have to kind of walk in a certain posture in a church to even notice when that's lifted. Because a wise leader will still walk with you and still love you and still care. They're just going to be careful about what they invest. Like, for example, it's possible to love, it's possible to hug, it's possible to be around and not do much formation. And you could be in a house and the word can form you, the people can form you, but I'm telling you, a leader, a sober one, I'm not talking about a crook or a criminal, or any of those people, they're going to put effort. If they see something, a potential, they're going to put effort. And some of that effort may be platform. Some of that effort may be opportunity. Some of that effort may be questions, questions. But you never want to ever be in a place where none of that is possible, where the extent of your leaders questioning you is, hi, how are you? Because <laughs> what it means is, the hard truth is they really have withdrawn their expectation of you. They don't think that you're going to be much more than what you are. And, 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 and so you may be like, well, how is that? How does that affect me? What it does is it eliminates your resource to one of the most important things you need in your life. And that's transparent, proactive rebuke. See, my heart is this. My heart is I, I, I don't want to be rebuked about things proactively. I, I, anybody that I submit to and under me, if they can forecast how something could potentially sidetrack me or become a distraction, tell me pre that. That's very, don't wait till I manifest the signs of it. Let's go to sushi, coffee, and tell me beforehand because for me, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an assignment man. I wanna protect my energy, protect my time. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. I'm on an assignment. So I don't want to go and make a mess and have bodies, you know, plastered, you know, after me. And then you come, hi, son, I just really feel like, no, 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 no. If I show a trait of that thing, put your finger on it immediately. And because of how I'm, I grew up, yes, sir, absolutely. I have had leaders call me and say, hey, be, care be careful about this. Be cautious about that. It's not that you've done anything, but I know you, you could probably react that way. And I'm like, absolutely. My friends have the right to do that. I had a couple of things happen probably about three months ago, and um, one of my friend, one of my boys called me and was like, hey man, don't you pick up that phone to Periscope, don't you pick up an iPad, I, 
if I look and see you about to pick up that phone or periscope, I'm going to come and throw it in the trash. So from every angle, I'm kind of surrounded with people who know my tendencies and, and why I would react to certain things in certain ways. But the most important thing that I have from them is their expectation. You understand what I'm saying? So I, I know that this is going to vary person to person, story to story, all of that. But the, the heart of this is to let you know you want your leader to believe that you can be better than what you are. You want your leader to understand that you can be different from how you are. You actually, like for me, I'm going to tell you another thing I have a problem with. I have a problem with, and I know some of you are probably getting kicked out just watching the replay. This is church. I have a problem with extremely decorative, arrogant, ostentatious bios. I can't stand them. When you have a bio that has to list every degree you have, your GPA, and what institution you got them from, um, the title of all 27 of your books, the names of who all ordained you, what year they ordained you, and what position you served in. Um, um, the full government names of all of your children and your wife and the year you got married. Um, what else have I seen? Oh, the fact that you have an uncanny, supernatural accuracy in the gifts of the spirit. And you are the eagle-eyed prophet with a laser-sharp accuracy and a, and a strong double portion anointing to see through walls and all that. People like me would look at something like that and decide I could go the rest of my life without ever having to hear anything you have to say. If you are in town and you were the last evangelist on the planet to lead me to the Lord, I believe God to send an angel. Wouldn't do it. Here's why. I, I believe that it is right to be sober in your presentation of who you are but what I really think is that you should let other people praise you that way. It's a sign that the anointing is lacking. My thing is stay low. You don't have to go to town about talking about how strong your gifts are and how strong your anointing is and how strong and your how many hoops you can you probably, Listen, here is my thing with that. I would rather you undersell and overproduce then overproduce and undersell. Listen, we have all made our mistakes. I just choose to allow my mistakes to be wisdom for pastors and people I lead. And one of the mistakes I made is that I brought people in because of their bios and sat there and listened to them people preach and wanted a refund. <laughs> sat there like, God, I cannot wait till this is over. I mean, I believed you. You said you was a, a, a prayer strategist and a supernatural general in the warfare and that you was the arc angles, my, my, you know, all that stuff. And I, I was sitting there like, God, this person, I mean. So, you know, I feel like undersell and overproduce because then when you undersell and overproduce, what have you done? You have taught your leader, you have taught your host, you have taught the authority figure to expect me to be superb. You can work wonders when the person over you has high expectations of you. And even if they have high expectations and you don't meet them, what you have still allocated to your life, please hear this, is counsel on how to get it right. My heart is, I never want to be the type of person that people don't think is worth counseling. I just couldn't. The thought of that, the Bible says, by wise counsel, a man wages his war. And I, listen, my life has been war. My career is war. For the, I always want to be somebody that people feel like I am worth telling. Make this adjustment. Make that adjustment. Soberly, without fluff, uh, you know, without anesthesia. Yeah, tell me. Why? I want to be my best self, even if at the present moment, I don't know what my best self is. So therefore, I will agree to cooperate with those who I trust can see my best self and can hear what they see that I could do differently or I could do wrong.
wrong. Either way, don't let me just go out and be hit by a, a Mack truck and watch me do it and, and let, the, let, let the pain of my cooperation be what actually counts as me. No, when your leader does not expect things from you, you in a bad place, bro. So, the National Preacher Society is going to revoke my membership because I let you into pastor and leadership secrets. But I'm telling you, when somebody that has been assigned to your life makes up their mind, mm -mm, I have no expectation. Like, like you call them like, you know, I really feel like the Lord is leading me. Um, somebody say, what if your leader never rebukes anywhere that you don't have a leader, you have a manager? Rebuke is a necessary and a biblical part of all leadership. So if your leader does not rebuke, you don't have a leader. You may have a messenger who has a, a position in the organization, but then they're not a heaven from lead. They're not a leader from heaven. Yeah, there's a lot of leaders. If we're honest, like if this is a leader only periscope, they would tell you, bruh, I got about 20, 20 that I have no expectation of. All of us have them. <laughs> like if this were a secret council meeting where I was asking leaders, do you have, no, it's just like, mm, I don't have expectation of that one. And it don't mean they love you any less. And it don't mean they don't even like you. It's just like, no, I know what's likely. See, the thing is a mature leader won't come to that resolve in 30 days. A mature leader won't come to that resolve in three years. A true leader will come to that resolve after consistent opportunities and attempts to develop you, to instruct you, to counsel you, to care for you, to adjust you, and you either don't respond, you respond wrongly, or you respond as if you know what's best. A mature leader is not going to contend with that. What they will do is withdraw their expectation. And what they'll do is they'll reserve that expectation to invest it in other people who can make it profitable. But you never want to be in a place where your leader doesn't expect you to do anything different from what you're doing because then they're not gonna counsel you at the next level. They're not gonna rebuke you at the next level. What they'll do is they'll give you insight for survival. They'll tell you how to manage today, how to cope with yesterday. They're not gonna exert the strength in your direction to get you to where they gotta go. If you've done something to make them do it so that's very first would you equate follow through with rebuke if in fact the person has not been rebuked uh yeah i think follow through is a good portion of rebuke because here's a deal if a person is investing a correction or investing a rebuke i think that it's responsible that that be a continued conversation so after the initial thing practically speaking somebody says hey you did this wrong or a hey, this is out of order or a hey, this is a devil or a hey, this is a character or whatever the presentation is i think that after that after the person who was rebuked hears it, thinks into it, responds it, and applies it, I think that there should be a good follow-up conversation because rebuke should bear fruit. If rebuke does not bear fruit, it was probably done with the wrong spirit or it was invested to the wrong person. Rebuke should bear fruit. That's why it's an investment, and that's why the Bible teaches that leaders should reserve who they do it to. Don't do it to anybody. Don't just do it randomly. There are people in my church, listen, Listen, there are some people <laughs> I'm not going to take the time to go to 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 invest a rebuke in people who have not proven that they are psychologically and emotionally handled to bear fruit from it. If somebody says, hey, this is what I think you should do. This is what I think you shouldn't do, et cetera, et cetera. You hear it, you receive it, you pray about it. If I were you, I would go to a couple of friends or girlfriends or sisters or whatever. And be like, hey, what do you think about this? I'm tendency to do that. Do I really? Oh, wow, that's crazy. Okay, so next time I would bring it up. Hey, I thought about what you said. I thought about what you did. This is how I'm putting it in action. Thank you so much. That gives a a a a, a green light to somebody to be able to say, I can consistently invest in this person. But if if you are rebuked and you shut down, or if you are rebuked and you get a, and you re respond hostily or angrily, or if you are rebuked and you go and get destructive and tear stuff down around you, then it's gonna be like a yellow or a red light that says, don't invest, don't invest. And if I can't invest, I, sh I cannot emotionally have expectation. If your leader, no matter how he or she is built, does not have an expectation for, for you, 
They're not going to pull from their spiritual reserves to dress you for where they should be taking you. This was key to my growth rebuke. Absolutely. Uh, there were times in my journey that I was rebuked for. I was not rebuked for things I thought I should have been and rebuked for other things. Like I thought I would be rebuked for being too direct and too blunt. Sometimes I was rebuked for not being direct enough or not being clear enough. So don't, and don't assume you know your leader. Some people will do stuff and pre get mad because they know how their leader is going to respond. Don't do that. When you assume your leader, what's happened is you have grown, come into a realm of familiarity where the density of their word in your life no longer has weight. And if it doesn't have weight it cannot work for you don't just project and put him or her in this thing and 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 think that you know um you know what they're going to do so you just kind of pre get an attitude and pre manifest not at all posture your heart stay low because you want your leader to expect if, 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 if one of my people at my church or one of my sons and my daughters does something stupid it's a good sign that i would be shocked <laughs> It's a bad sign if you come and you say, hey, um, I, I did something stupid or I've been unintegral. And you're like, okay, awesome. That's powerful. All right, well, thank you for the update. Talk to you soon. <laughs> That's a bad sign. It means that somewhere your leader stopped believing in you. And before you get mad and angry and say, as any church people do, it might be your fault. I think that the, the byproduct of this conversation is that I need to do a Periscope series called Church Stuff, where I talk about the perspective of the pastor and the experiences of the people um, for like seven days, church stuff. I think that would be really, 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 really good. Hey, I got to go get my babies. So I love you. Um, consider what I've said. You want your leader to expect things uh, from you. And uh, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to be daddy right now. I just want to give you something to think about, wet your palate a little bit, and I'll talk to you soon. All right. Love you. Bye.